we are with uh, Derek uh, Herbert. I'm gonna mess up your name already. So we're with Derek Dennis Herbert, and he is the director of To Hell and Back, The Kane Hodder Story. And uh, we just got out of the walk this screening of it here in Austin. Um, so you were kind of describing a little bit. Um, uh, how did you get interested in doing this project about Kane Hodder? Well, I, I was interested in doing a project in general about mm -hmm. uh, I, a performer, and I thought the horror genre is one that I'm a huge fan of, and I could really uh, find myself getting enthusiastic about it. So I was looking for someone who had a horror story, but also something that was human interest. So I uh, started looking around for stories and hearing interviews from people, and stumbled upon a few videos of Kane at like events like uh, signings at Dark Delicacies in Burbank or uh, various other things, and we determined that uh, I determined that he spoke well and was able to do, you know, a compelling story. And I was intrigued by his story, so I ended up reading his book that he wrote with Mike Alisi called Unmasked, and I realized that he had a great story that both would appeal to human interest fans and documentary fans in general, and people who love horror equally. So I wanted, we reached out to him, my uh, best friend is his, my attorney and uh, now a producer on the film, so he reached out uh, on my behalf to Kane's manager. We set up a meeting with Kane and uh, from there we all clicked and uh, we made it happen. Was he excited? Was he on board that somebody was going to film it? I mean, I know y'all went through a lot of, to some of the old places that, that brought back a lot of odd memories and, and I'm sure painful memories, but was he really excited about doing it? Was he a little hesitant? He was excited about it from my point, from, from us doing it, because he had been approached by big studios before, but he never had the element of control that we offered to give him. If he wanted, if he could have final approval, he could make suggestions to modify things. If he didn't like anything, he could ask us to change it before he gave his approval. So, I mean, I think that element of control, the same one that Mike Aloisi let him have as far as the book went, allowed him to trust us so that he did get on board and become enthusiastic. Some of the additional things that ended up being somewhat painful were always things we wish to do but sort of got added on officially as it went on like the burn center was always one like yeah well we're gonna try to go there but then it worked out perfectly that we were able to go in the two days that it was between being an active burn center and a the or with some renovations done so it's like it was that perfect mix of both and how many, uh, did he tell you which celebrities to reach out to, or was that something that you did on your own? Well, did you have a hard time finding a lot of these celebrities? Yeah, well, Andrew and I, uh, who's my uh, producer, he and I came up with a list, Kane came up with a list, and we compared them, and uh, then we determined what the best method of reaching out to them would be, be it us getting, uh, us reaching out to them, like Andrew as the legal slash producer representative being like, hey, we're doing this project, do you want to be a part of it? Or a lot of people Kane himself would reach out to and say, listen, this is my official documentary these guys are doing, would you do me a favor and go and do an interview with them? And then they'd say yes, and they'd reach out to us a lot of times and we'd set up the details of it. But yeah, a lot you said of it took how many days to, to, to film? You said it didn't take long. I mean, of just Kane, it was two days in LA uh, at a soundstage and two days in Hawaii uh, in a hotel room that, that was overlooking, for people who have seen the movie, overlooking the, uh, uh, a beautiful view of Hawaii. So, um, yeah, we had 39 hours of footage of just Kane, but the rest of the movie, all the other places, you know, we took a while to film because we, it just was a lot of time in between places and, and individual days to shoot like the other people. We had days where we'd shoot like one celebrity on that day or two on that day. So to get everybody together, it ended up taking a while. We were filming from June 2015 to like March or April 2016. So, uh, Almost a year. And I know you wore a lot of hats. What yeah. did you do for this particular movie? I mean, well, I know you're the director. Clearly. I was the director, producer, um, executive producer, um, and assistant editor. Those are all the titles I had. For, yeah. So this really was a project of your life. It was. Yeah, it's the first project I directed uh, with my uh, it, as a feature, and it was also the first project through the company Andrew and I have, Master Film Comic Entertainment, and we wanted it to be something we were both proud of and, and you know, excited about bringing to you know, the public and, and 
and stuff. So yeah, we all sort of wore a bunch of hats and, and really pushed through and you know, are really hoping that that passion is going to translate into people buying VOD copy, buying Blu-rays and coming out to the theatrical events and getting excited about the film uh, so that we can make more. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, how did you get into horror movies and this horror genre and then just the filmmaking as, as yeah. a whole? Yeah, um, horror, I, mean, I was not as big into it until I was in college, actually. I liked it before then, but I, I really jumped into it a lot in, in college, in film school. I uh, really, kind of my DP of this film, Zach Hunter, showed me a lot of great horror movies and I became, you know, grew to love them and become a fan. And then uh, filmmaking though, ever since I was three and a half, and strangely enough saw Home Alone 2, it was the first movie I saw in theaters. <laughs> Which is a lot I, of yeah. Sort of, yeah. I loved that movie and I said, this is what I want to do. And ever since then I haven't wavered on it, ever. Like that's what I've wanted to do since I was three and a half and now that's what I'm doing. Uh, and I know that, you know, you didn't just go with Okay, here's the beginning of his career, here's that where he grew up, and now we're going to follow his career all the way through. I know you broke it up a little bit here for the dramatic and the rise of his career, and you, you, you have some very sentimental parts in there that's not just horror based. What made you think that that, I mean, how did you come about that? Yeah, well the editor, Mike Hugo, uh, he's a great editor we had, he, he worked on a the Oscar-nominated Florida project a little while ago, Willem Dafoe, he was an editor on that. We uh, did it chronologically at first, but then we decided to, uh, both of us never thought that's how it would be, but we just wanted to see how it played. And we started playing around with moving it around so that about every 10 to 15 minutes, we always wanted there to be something that the horror community would love, and something that the human interest crowd would also be able to get behind. So we never wanted to, dwell on anyone for too, too long. We wanted to give people a, ch a breather of something fun or a breather of something a little either happy or sad, but like about Kane, not necessarily about his career. Because he's had a life that's crazy enough with, without the career stuff, but especially with the career stuff. Is there anything that surprised you about Kane Hunter? Like I think just how much he cares. I mean, even if, I, if I'm like, he, he calls me up every once in a while, like, just to chat about like, something with the film or just in general, see how I'm doing. And if, like, I woke up with a scratchy throat or anything like that, he's legitimately concerned. He's like a good guy. When he cares, he's going to care deeply about you. And he, it really is nice to know that I have this, you know, lifelong colleague in him. Uh, you know, someone who is, I'm more, I'm on very good terms with and who, uh, appreciates my work and, and, uh, and me as a person, and I hit him. It's the same way, I always call to make sure he's all right during some of these fires that we've had recently in LA, or uh, during, uh, just in general, you know, my CDs had a particularly long convention or shooting schedule. Uh, you were talking uh, earlier about the scenery that y'all had come across. So tell us a little bit more about, because you have some great shots in there. Yeah, we did. Just some beautiful scenery. So. We did a day of shooting, uh, like uh, the professional term that we use is B-roll, uh, so non-main town based stuff, and we did, uh, we got a day of that with Outkin, uh up in the area of Santa Clarita, Valencia, where a fire had gone through, and we loved it so much as itself, and a lot of the, there's some shots of that there that are non k oriented but we always wanted to do a day, at least one day with him out there, so we found a beautiful park uh, for a lot of bullying shots. We found this one area up in Valencia, Santa Clarita that had, it was all like burned area, but some life still, some, some new grass, some new flowers and stuff coming out of death. And we thought it was a pretty cool, you know, metaphor there of some, you know, the fact that if death can come from, or life can come from it, then in the parallels of his his own story, we kept showing more and more of the life surrounding that area when you know, his life was getting better and things were getting better for him in the burn recovery or uh, in his uh, in his life as the Freddy vs. Jason and Catch. Well, are there any upcoming projects that you are uh, excited about? I am. Other than this this particular film. 
Yeah, I am. We, uh, I, Andrew and I produced a film called They're Inside. It's a, a uh, like psychological horror film. Uh, it's like a thriller uh, home invasion movie about two sisters who go up to a house to film a movie. Uh, with some friends, and all things kind of go to hell, <laughs> and, uh, as, they do. as they do, and you know, uh, it's a great movie, and we're very excited, that's just started the festival submission cycle, but you know, a great director, John Paul Pinelli directed it, uh, as well as wrote it with uh, Skylar Brumley, uh, and it's going to be a, uh, it's, it's a great film, uh, we're very proud of that one. I also, am, uh, at some point, I'm directing uh, and producing documentary on Hollister, the Rocky of uh, documentaries on, of the film industry. And that one's still in its early stages, but Adam and us are excited about it when the time comes to get to jump into there. We've already had meetings to discuss, you know, what that project will look like on a surface level. And as it gets closer, we're going to meet, obviously, to discuss more, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one what it's going to be like to actually shoot this thing. And tell us more uh, for about when this particular movie comes out. Yeah, well, Talent Back comes out uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, July 13th, 2018, uh, on VOD everywhere and Blu ray DVD combo pack. Uh, so it'll be on all the iTunes, Amazon, all those kind of platforms, as well as uh, at the Amazon and EpicPictures.com is the best place to buy the Blu ray. Uh, it has 90 minutes of bonus footage that I self curated of uh, uh, tons of deleted scenes and uh, new and, and extended sections of the of the documentary. That if you were watching this and you're like, oh man, I wish we would have seen more of this, you probably will in that because we definitely worked in a lot of the stuff that, while great stories were not necessarily uh, crucial to. Um, the Kane's direct story. We always thought, is this important to Kane's career or Kane? And if it wasn't important to Kane's story, sometimes they got cut, even if they were important to his career. Because we're telling his story, his personal story, yeah. not necessarily his career. We could have made two documentaries, one that was like just about his personal life and one that was about his career. But to make one and make it a uh, light where it feels nice and short, like I think this one does, is to uh, make it, keep it short and give people more as a, as a bonus, not have a four hour documentary. Not that those aren't great, but for this one I wanted to make it digestible for those human interest people. Scrolling through Amazon Prime or one of those things and clicking on it and saying, we'll give this movie a chance. So why not buy this $15 Blu-ray? This sounds like a great story. It's a digestible length, and I think people are going to love it. As a Texan, I, I will say I love seeing him as a Texan day in your shirt. Through a lot of the, the burn center scenes. Um, well, his son uh, either went or is still going to Texas a &M. So that's one of the reasons why he, he loves the schools that his kids go to. And he supports, wears their shirts all the time, too. <laughs> Because he's, he's, he's a proud dad, I mean, and he should be. His kids are uh, great, you know, ships off the old yacht. They're both passionate about what they want to do, not in film, but they want to do their, they have passion of their own, and they're, you know, gung-ho about it, and they're very well-adjusted. I mean, they grew up in, you know, wealth, and they do not act like it. They feel very grateful for what they have, and, and the fact that their dad is able to spend as much time with them as he can. Yeah, you can definitely see it in the movie. He comes across really like down to earth. Kind of guy. He is. I, I don't think he's, he's. I think he's very humble by what he has. He is. Nice. He grew up in Nevada with not a, a lot, so he he still like enjoys like a beer, grab a Pabst Blue Ribbon or a Coors Light or something. He'll he'll uh, sit you know down and you know, eat a burger. He's not necessarily eating lobster and drinking uh, two thousand dollar bottles of wine. He's he is still the same guy he grew up just with more money and you know he likes certain things more expensive or he has a nice car and nice house you know but he, they keep it really uh, positive and really you know down to earth and I think that's important to yeah, I think that's why they're able to have the kids they have while they're able to be the great people they are because they don't let it get to them as much they just continue to live their lives <laughs> Well, we hope to see more, and I hope that you do another one in 10 years. 
to follow back up because you said obviously that it would be a great yeah, project. Yeah, I would. I'd love to. Assuming this one does well, so all everyone watching go out and buy it, and so we can get and make more projects and, and show Fred Central Presents and having pictures that this film is should get a 10th anniversary edition. Because I would love to go and do, even if it's like a 30 minute documentary follow up for the Blu-ray, the next Blu-ray of like what uh, Kane's been up to, I'd love to go back, interview some more people and show what he's really been doing since uh, we left off. Because there's already a bunch of stuff we can cover career-wise. And you know, I'm sure there'll be plenty of stuff in the future. Are there any celebrities that you were interviewing for this that you thought, I would love to do a documentary about this? You seem very interesting. I'd love to give you the same thing on our show. Definitely, but I'm not going to name any names. I can't. <laughs> until something's signed in stone, and until we officially have something planned, I don't want to say anything like that. Just because, obviously, we we have until we pay back the investors for this one, we're not going to be able to make the next one. So we just want to make sure that when we announce something, it's going to be when we're ready to when we're filming or when the movie's already in the can, and we have a, like a plan for it because we want to make sure that, uh, like obviously in this town, Kane mentions it, you know. People talk is cheap. I want a, I want something in writing. I want something filmed before I uh, I talk about it because I just want to make sure that the next one does happen and, and happen well. And I think the first step of that is for this one to come out and do do well. And uh, you know, I think that's on the fans to buy it, watch it legally, not download it illegally. We're making this film very available for a very reasonable cost. It's like 10 bucks on VOD or $14.99 on Blu-ray. So I don't think there's any reason that people should pirate the movie. Uh, because I think that, you know, I understand potentially doing something that's very difficult to find. This is going to be very easy to find and within the price range where I think people, it's like, why not? Why not pay for it legally? Let the independent filmmakers make content. Because if you like it, you're going to want us to do more. And if you pirate it, we're not going to be able to. So I think that it's... Uh, it's very important for the community. It's very important the community. Really good. Exactly. Like, and we need good directors and, and good people like Kane. Yeah, we need people like Kane to be able to keep making content and agreeing to be able to keep making content. Hopefully us to continue making content as well. Um, and you know, and that all stems from the fans. Uh, and there's so many amazing fans, and I'm not categorizing them all as people who would illegally download. I know many of them would never do that. And many of them who do don't think it hurts anybody, but it can. And I just want to, like, for us, it would, because we're so, you know, low budget, and, you know, it costs more than some people think, but it wasn't a ton to make. We don't want to, we want to be able to pay it back.